Cool. Um, so my talk is called A Little Birdie Told Me About Your Warrants. Um, <laughs> so hi, uh, my name is Avi, and um, I am not a lawyer, so we're just going to go right there. Cool. So um, I became interested in Warren Canaries about two years ago, just before the Reddit uh, Warren Canary was taken down. Um, I personally believe that Warren Canaries haven't been given the opportunity they really deserve to be given a chance for. Um, I feel like, yes, they are a gray legal area, of course, at the moment. Um, and compared to Australia at the moment, but, so I'm talking when I talk tonight, it's going to be about U.S. politics and all of that, not anywhere else. Um, so another thing that really got me interested was when the uh, Canary Watch project was discontinued. Um, that also got me really interested in the project too. And I feel like right now we're in a defining point in time uh, to protect and defend our civil liberties and our privacy. Um, like right now we have companies who are trying to further implement uh, ways to sell our data. We have governments who are trying to collect our data and um, mass survey all of us. Uh, we have stuff like that happening right now and I feel like we need to be more concerned about it than we already are and then just give up. Um, so I feel like everyone from anyone here, um, everyone out everywhere I guess, uh, companies, organizations should all be aware of what rights they have um, how to implement or help implement new policies and legislative work, and just work on creating new ways to push back. So, uh, this isn't a full background, background in history, of course, but it's a brief one that I thought were good points of explaining how we got to where we are now. Um, so, a national security letter is not actually a warrant, um, but it has been used as if it were kind of one. It, when you see the FBI seal, of course, you kind of freak out because the FBI are the uh, ones with the highest amount of um, issuers of NSLs or national security letters. Um, anyone f from the FBI who is a special agent in charge can issue one, which is kind of ridiculous in my opinion. Um, but yeah, so what can be requested? Uh, Non-content information, uh, metadata is data by the way. Um, so in the core essence of it, um, they should be able to request your name, address, transaction records, which is controversial a bit for the FBI apparently, uh, but that includes the date, time, and length of your calls, and when, length of service, which means like whenever you became a customer of that provider. Um, in 2008, a guidance from the Justice Department said that transaction records are phone billing records, and that will make more sense in a bit also, but in 2014, uh, the FBI Inspector General report indicated that they disagreed with that memo and instead they have repeatedly ignored law entirely on that one and claiming electronic communications uh, transaction records which does not actually exist. Uh, so that's a thing. Uh, they make a really vague point inside of all of their letters trying to be very um, ambiguous about it. That way they confuse people who aren't aware of their rights. Uh, which I just basically said there but also it enables them to uh, work on furthering their work on uh, mass surveillance by collecting data off of people who aren't even the original targets of that NSL in the first place. So, um, some of the key points here, I did write a lot here, but it's mostly just to back up what I'm saying, so if you want to read it, you can. Uh, essentially, in 1978, the first uh, NSL was created as an investigative tool for terrorism espionage uh, investigations for financial fraud. Um, it was used sparingly because the FBI had to show beforehand that the target was a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power um, before obtaining the records. Uh, even including in the amended version and the ECPA, uh, you still had no penalties if you did not abide by the uh, NSL. There was no penalty for it. And in some states also with the ECPA and all of that, uh, states actually had laws that made it so you couldn't even, you could just outright reject an NSL. It's basically completely voluntary for a while. But um, 1993 is when things started changing. Uh, that was the first time when NSLs could be used as a way to request info on people that were not the direct targets of the investigation. And of course that removed the restriction of the uh, requirement of being a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. Um, so in 2000, about 8,500 NSLs were issued, uh, but that completely changed starting a year afterwards in 2001 when the USA Patriot Act of 2001 was signed into law. Uh, in Section 505 specifically, it really did reduce the standards. Um, so once again, the 8,500, they were all done without judicial process, so no judge ever first saw those NSLs. Um, it gave them the ability to send NSLs to banks, libraries, telephone companies, and internet companies. 
Um, the right to counsel was not made explicit, so people weren't even aware if they could talk to their lawyer about it. And a statute uh, by recipients from disclosing their demand, which is the gag order right there. Um, in April of 2004 uh, is when Doe versus Ashcroft was uh, filed on, by the ACLU, uh, which we later found out who it was, of course, but it took six years to get to that point. Um, something related a little bit is that a provision, a provision in the USA Patriot Act um, allowed the, authority, like the FBI to issue NSLs to obtain uh, records from electronic communications providers without the judicial oversight again. So it's starting to lead up a little bit more intensely. So that's 5,600 and 507 NSLs that were issued in 2004. It's the highest amount of NSLs issued in a year without any judge overviewing any of those with a categorical and permanent gag order. Um, continuing in 2004, uh, we had a, it went to uh, Judge Victor Marrero, um, who did decide that it violated the First Amendment it had a lack of clear enforcement, explicitly uh, referenced recipient, uh, the recipient's right to counsel, and so it got struck down. Uh, but in 2005, Congress amended uh, to, uh, Section 2709 again back into the USA Patriot Improvement and Reauthorization Act of 2005. Um, this time it did give some amount of rights, but not that much at all. Uh, in 2007, though, uh, the ACLU and NYCLU uh, were able to argue again uh, to, um, that Congress had not addressed all the deficiencies in the new amended version in 2005, and so the same judge uh, agreed once again to strike it down. Um, and then the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals uh, affirmed most of that decision because it, uh, they invalidated part of the statute where um, basically uh, they are placing the burden on the recipients to initiate the, judi the judicial process. Um, on gag orders, so now um, the government has the burden to go to court to justify why it is an issue and why the disclosure of the NSO would cause harm for national security issues, stuff like that. Um, in 2010, uh, finally six years later, after the initial um, uh, start of the Doe versus Ashcroft case, uh, Nicholas Merrill was finally revealed as the uh, plaintiff, plaintiff in that case. Um, but it was another five years after that before he could freely speak completely because uh, that was only a partial in 2010, but it was fully lifted in 2015. Uh, so this is where I personally find it gets really interesting for all of us and why I think people should be more con like concerned for their um, individual uh, selves also. Um, but just as a quick fact, uh, around 2013, Pres uh, President Barack Obama's uh, intelligence review could be uh, reported about 60s NSLs were issued daily. Um, but the fun part for me comes with the Cloudflare case. Uh, they were in a joint um, case with Credo Mobile. I don't know how to pronounce that. Sorry. Cool. Um, so basically, in February, they were issued an NSO, and so the EFF decided to take their case. And at this point, uh, they were able to, in their entire case, in the whole span of the time it went, uh, the FBI must now only re they have to reassess kind of their gag order uh, three years into it, which is why you'll see right there on the slide, it's 2017 when they finally revealed it. Um, but it left, lifted in the end of 2016. Um, or they can also uh, lift the gag order once the investigation's over. Um, in 2014, uh, Ken Carter from Cloudflare met with a key Capitol Hill staffer who worked on counter, um, oh shoot, I never set my timer, cool. Uh, Counterterrorism, Homeland Security, and judiciary uh, stuff like that. And in quotes, he said to that, Staffer, um, trans uh, Claffer cares about uh, transparency, due process of law, and expressed concerns that NSLs are unconstitutional tools of convenience rather than necessity. Uh, except the staffer completely dismissed that and instead said that the concerns were, um, and the position that Claffer had on all of that was that NSLs was a product of needless worrying, uh, speculation, and misinformation, and also in quotes, staff noted it would be impossible for an NSL to issue against Cloudflare since the services our company provides expressly did not fall under the jurisdiction of the NSL statute. And of course, because of the gag order, um, he could not tell the staffer that in fact they had been issued this NSL in the first place and that they were incorrect even if that person actually made it a point by reading the actual US code directly to Kenny Carter, which is kind of like more like adding insult to injury at that point, right? Um, 
But yeah, so at the end of 2016, uh, the gag order was finally removed, and Cloudflare finally revealed that the, they had received the NSL in 2013 uh, in their transparency report for the second half of 2016. In um, 2017, July, uh, the U.S. Ninth Court, uh, Circuit Court of Appeals released their latest decision, endorsed, unfortunately, they endorsed uh, the usage of gag orders, which really sucks in this case. So that's where we're currently at with at least that case moment. But that's kind of terrifying if you think about it, because the fact that, like, a staffer that does all of this to, like, you know, make laws for us is, like, unable to, like, know that this is happening, and that's kind of horrifying, because... If that can be applied to Cloudflare, it can apply to like a lot of different people, which it most likely is, uh, to people who aren't aware of their rights. Um, and the fact that they were issued an NSL, but they immediately almost rescinded that NSL and withdrew the request, uh, shows that they're really just like sending out all these letters and hoping they get back information they're not actually supposed to be getting in the first place, because these are just subpoenas um, for a limited amount of information that shouldn't have content in them. Um, so uh, background and history of Warren Canaries. Uh, so this is kind of horrifying, <laughs> uh, but canaries and coal mines uh, were a thing from 1911 from to 1986. Uh, quick fact on that one, uh, John Scott Haldane uh, discovered um, from his research that um, canaries were able to detect carbon monoxide and other toxic gases before humans got hurt, but then they finally decided to do more humane options, at least in the States in 1986, which is great. Um, and let's see, so uh, what a Warren Canary is, it's right there. Um, it's basically currently in the United States an untested legal theory which, where providers traditionally state publicly they have not received a NSL. I say traditionally because I think we should change what we think of Warren Canaries in the first place because I think we have a misassumption about what they are. Um, so quick things, uh, 2006, uh, rsync.net became the first commercial provider to publish their Warren Canary. And 2016, this is when things really got interesting for Warren Canaries in terms of like the height of popularity, which you'll see in a second. Uh, Reddit removed their Warren Canary and it like got everyone's attention for the first time. Uh, basically, they had their Warren Canary in their 2014 transparency report. And then in their 2015, it completely disappeared and it hasn't reappeared since. Uh, so fun fact, DuckDuckGo, of course, does not save your search results, which is great. So there is no such graph on DuckDuckGo's engine, which is great. Uh, but if you use Google, Huzzah! Um, you can see in April 2016, um, which is when news really broke out into the news cycle about Reddit's Warren Canary being removed, uh, they hit the peak of popularity of interest over time in April 2016, but you can see it basically just went down right afterwards uh, due to a lot of criticism, but we'll get to that in a second also. So some Warren Canary projects. Um, so Canary Watch was personally my favorite also, but it was also the largest one. It was launched in um, 2015 by Coalition of the EFF, Freedom of the Press Foundation, NYU Law, Cal Institute, which was run by uh, Nicholas Merrill, and the Berkman Center. Um, it was discontinued in 2016, about a year later, basically. Um, they, in their like, final thing, uh, the EFF stated that they had achieved their goals to raise awareness, um, but they made a good point and a nice uh, list of why Warren Canaries have issues, and like, that was their um, criticisms of them. Uh, they did know that they have a really, uh, there's no one standard for how you can do a Warren Canary. Um, some people like to sign them with a key. Some people just have like, a good GIF for some reason, which is cool. Um, some people have it in like a transparency report. Sometimes the wording is really vague, so it's really kind of weird, right? Um, so this is what I would have presented on for a little bit. Uh, this is the project I made. Um, but as a PSA, um, if you have something you want to present, definitely do a backup of it. Uh, last night, I had the fun experience of uh, it going down, so I recommend doing backups. And also, if your threat model works, it definitely works really well. <laughs> Oops. So yeah, um, basically, I, this is what my project is. If you want to get involved after I retype all my code out again once I get home, um, let's have fun. Cool. Uh, so I do want to bring up uh, some good points about why there are criticisms of Warren Canaries, because there are issues I can agree with. Um, uh, some, a personal favorite of mine is the most uh, vocal opponent of Warren Canaries, um, Bruce Schneier, if I'm pronouncing his name right, I hope. He's like an EFF board member, which is really cool. Um, he really hates Warren Canaries, and um, of course, because the Warren Canary news came out in April 1st, I thought at first maybe it was a total joke. <laughs> Um, but it actually wasn't. Um, but this is his uh, 2016 uh, Reddit uh, Warren Canary post. Um, and he has several just like that for every single Warren Canary. It's amazing. Um, but the EFF has a really great issue with the breakdown from when they uh, took down and discontinued the warrant uh, 
uh, the Dirt Canary Watch project with everyone else. So some other issues, they might be illegal. We don't know yet because no one's actually really tested them yet legally. Um, so we're not clear if it's possible for the government to legally require companies to lie about requests. And it's kind of like conflicting, right? Because like some companies have a requirement with other laws, right? And if they were told they had to lie about something, then they'd be breaking those regulations and laws. And it's like an interesting thought experiment right there too. Um, so minor events and like lack of information can lead to things. Like say that you forgot to like update your warrant canary, um, then that might cause like, un like fear of accident, which happened a lot, which also made their popularity go down because people freaked out and then turned out there was no issue. Um, we're also like companies could potentially lie about their requests or employees who are supposed to be responsible for, for like talking about the canaries uh, might be unaware of the request. So there's lots of different issues that could happen. And there's also of course the issue of lots of varying formats, which I'm hoping to fix with my project, but you know. Uh, so, or it's okay to not have a warm canary if you don't collect unnecessary and sensitive user data. Uh, so like if you just don't do that, like you don't need a canary, which is awesome. And I think most products don't really need it anyways. So yeah, you don't need your toilet type information, so it's cool. So, um, right. So these are things that in my ideal world, because I am not a lawyer at all, I would love to see happen, but I, these are options I would love to see in the world in the future, of course, of people, uh, companies, and organizations and what they can do about things. So I think everyone should have a warrant canary available easily that is specific to their needs of compromise. Uh, so something I like to think about is like if you have a personal website and you have a form, right? Like you ask people to like submit like a comment or like ask us a question and it like you know it's, you store it in like a database or your email. I don't know. Um, if you think about it, that is a collection of data, right? And even though it shouldn't technically fall under everything else that's required to be used for like issuing an NSL. Of course, we're seeing that FBI is not following their own laws. So I recommend, I think everyone should have a warrant canary. It's really cool. Um, people should just in general not collect data. That isn't relevant. I still don't see why we need data for a toilet. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm still like laughing about that. I can't believe it's real. Um, so people I think should sell products at a higher cost without selling out our data. Cause like, honestly, I'd rather pay for something than to have it be used maliciously away from me and being like targeted at me, which is horrifying to think of also. And also I think if you do receive an NSL and a gag order, you should challenge the legality of it. Um, I would love to also see different like types of um, war canaries where like maybe you do it like every single day or like every week or like have something really specific that's very, very specific and we'll see how it goes. Hopefully if someone wants to also do that too. Um, I think that anyone that has any type of database or collection of that user data or information should limit the type of data collected because right now we are seeing that the FBI is no matter, even though they're supposed to not be doing this and they claim it's very limited, we still see hundreds of different NSL requests which basically are looking for persons of interest, uh, communities of interest which essentially, you start from one target technically and you look for their associates and then from there you look for more suspects and then you keep expanding and growing out that, and that's how you get to mass surveillance and collection of data, which shouldn't be happening in the first place. Um, so if you are collecting user data, you should limit the type of information that connects them to other people. That way they don't get brought into the entire mess and become part of a database. And this is still the feature I'd love to see very much and I'm still not a lawyer. Cool. And <laughs> so I think the work being done to challenge NSLs and gag orders is like really hard and like after just researching it for like last two years, I'm like, oh my God, it's like, this is tiring. Um, so if you're like wanting to like support everyone's work with like getting our like privacy, like secured, I guess, if that makes sense, uh, then you should donate to like organizations like the EFF, the ACLU, NYCLU, and like other similar places. They're all working towards a future where we can like freely post on the internet and not worry about the FBI just like mining all of our data, which is great. Uh, and also you can petition and speak with members of Congress to reform the laws surrounding NSLs and gag orders, which would be cool because a lot of people don't even know that this is happening, which is kind of insane, but there's so many things to worry about. So I think if you want to care about more about this, uh, talk to you, your member of Congress. And it's the feature I'd like to see very much. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh,